Hello interwebs and welcome to my channel and for today's video I'm doing something incredibly nerdy even for nerds and doing yet again another review of the latest Star Trek tie-in novel release. This time it's the Star Trek Voyager novel To Lose the Earth by Kirsten Beyer. Now before I get into my actual review of the book proper I think that it's important to um, make mention of a few important things surrounding this book. First off this book is written by Kirsten Beyer who many of you may know from her work on Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery. Kirsten Beyer has been a long time Star Trek novelist and has been writing a lot of Star Trek Voyager books all culminating in this book but also back when Star Trek Discovery started way back in its first season she was brought on to that show's writing team and kind of became a writer on the show but also a liaison to all the tie-in media kind of coordinating all the comics books and all ancillary stuff that was going on around Star Trek so her job is incredibly important on that show and to Star Trek as a whole to try and keep everything cohesive and tied in and you know all all kind of connected as is possible with tie-in media, which I incredibly appreciate her work on. But she's also became the executive producer, one of the creators for Star Trek Picard, so her influence has just been steadily growing in Star Trek over the past few years. This book is also notable, kind of off the back of that, for being the last Star Trek Voyager novel in the post-Star Trek Nemesis literary timeline. For those of you who don't know, after Star Trek Nemesis came out, there was this long, 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 long period where we didn't have any Star Trek media that took place after Star Trek Nemesis, other than like some small hints in Star Trek 2009. Now that started to change with uh, Star Trek Picard coming out and being set several, um, you know, years after the end of Star Trek Nemesis, as well as Star Trek Discovery going hundreds and hundreds of years past that point now in season three. So there were all of these books that were set in that timeline post Star Trek Nemesis that sort of continued that story forward with Titan, with the Next Generation crew, with Deep Space Nine, and also with Voyager. And Kirsten Beyer was sort of heading that charge with these storylines with the Voyager crew. But unfortunately, because of the shows going forward, all of that stuff does no longer fit in canon. And so, unfortunately, this is the last book that is going to be set in this version of the Star Trek Voyager timeline, at least as far as we know. Um, so that's incredibly sad, and it also kind of fits with Kirsten Beyer because she also talked about in several interviews that she's just really busy now because she's got a lot going on. So she kind of had to write this book in fits and spurts. She couldn't actually sit down and focus on it because she just had so much more to do. Um, so this was going to be her last hurrah, and so it's also kind of a send-off of this timeline as a whole in many ways and sort of her uh, work on the Voyager uh, Voyager crew and I'll get to how that fits into the novel proper and how that comes up and I think it comes up in a really beautiful way So all that stuff is really important to notice um, There is some hints and I won't spoil it until I get into the spoiler section of my review here But there are some hints as to what the writers of the Star Trek post nemesis timeline plan to do Now that there are going to be sort of erasing this version of the beta canon now that we're getting into new stuff But I'll talk about that a little bit more in spoilers But there are some hints of that here that I think are incredibly cool But that's for other books going on that I'm very very excited about to see what they do with but now let me get into the actual book proper now that I've given you all that interesting backstory on this book. I, this is why I find tie-in books interesting, by the way, for Star Trek. They just do cool and weird stuff and like have to like retcon and kind of play with what goes on in the TV show. I don't know. I find Beta Cannon to be fascinating because it does all like the legwork of explaining stuff behind the scenes, but also has to like weirdly fit canon. It's just kind of fun to see universes bend and seeing which ways and different tangents it can go. So if you're not a Star Trek book fan, I would recommend it because it's just fun to learn all this stuff. Anyways, review of the book proper. Um, instead of me nerding out about the nerdiest of things, which is tie-in media of <laughs> Of big franchises. God, I'm a huge nerd. So To Lose the Earth takes place immediately after the end of the last book, Architects of Infinity. And for those of you who don't know, the Voyager crew had been sent back into the Delta Quadrant to sort of explore the Delta Quadrant again after the events of Star Trek Nemesis and after the events of Star Trek Destiny, which is a book trilogy that dealt with the Borg. And it was the uh, Voyager crew sort of going back out into the Delta Quadrant to explore now the, that the Borg are no longer a big threat in the Delta Quadrant. Again, that happens in Star Trek Destiny. Spoilers for those books. They're great. You should check them out. But Architects of Infinity end on this huge cliffhanger with one of the ships that was sent with Voyager in their full circle fleet, the USS Galen, which was a ship that was mostly um, crewed by holograms, including the Doctor, um, being destroyed, completely gone, along with Harry Kim on it, one of the main characters from Voyager, who is now a lieutenant. He finally got promoted. Um, so that was how the last book ended, and we finally get the payoff to that in this book. And so spoilers, if you don't want any spoilers for the end of that book going into this one, but of course the USS Galen actually survived that, but was sent across the galaxy, basically like q -Hood shoved all across the galaxy by an incredibly powerful force called the Edramaya, a type of alien race that is older and seemingly more powerful and more inscrutable 
people than the Borg themselves and don't seem to understand or able to communicate with the crew of the USS Galen and the Voyager sort of crew sort of having to figure out what happened to the USS Galen, did it get destroyed, and sort of dealing with their grief at losing their friend Lieutenant Kim. So all of that's sort of the interesting setup, and it, I think it creates for a really, really wonderful story. One of the things that I love most about Kirsten Byer's writing that you can see influencing how Star Trek Discovery is written as well, um, and Star Trek Picard as well, um, but I think Discovery kind of shows this and displays this a little bit more, is Kirsten Byer has such wonderful attention to the emotional nuance and emotional well-being of her characters. Almost every single scene shows a real depth of emotional um, underpinnings and understanding with all of her characters, and most notably uh, for Lieutenant Harry Kim. It's weird calling him a lieutenant in this review. I, 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 I'll never get used to him not being an ensign. Oh. My, my baby boy is growing up. In this book, Lieutenant Kim is kind of wrestling with the fact that he is now a new parent. We, he, you know, had a, uh, a child with another crew member in, in the last book. Kind of spoilers for that. Um, but also coming to terms with that his the mother of his child, who is not married to, also doesn't really have full com uh, unconflicted feelings about him. That she doesn't really know if she wants to be with him. Also, she's going through her own medical problems and medical ethics. Um, so, Lieutenant Kim is definitely wrestling with this. Also, on top of that, being in one of the most stressful situations of his life. And also being the commander at the time of the USS Galen. Because the captain of the ship is actually um, out of commission because of the sh being shoved across the universe so harshly. So, all of this stuff is weighing on Lieutenant Kim. And he's had no sleep. He's trying to keep things together. And he's trying to deal with with all of this personal stuff going on as well. And so I think Kirsten Byer just does a wonderful job sort of diving into Harry Kim's headspace and probably doing a better job of developing him than any other uh, any other book or even the TV show did for the character. And I really appreciated that sort of struggling that we see within him as he's trying to hold it all together and actually failing at a few t points in time where he doesn't always live up to being the best leader, but also standing up for his values, knowing when to push back against the captain when the captain does get revived, but also knowing when to understand that his place is as a subordinate to the captain, even though he may have strong opinions. So really seeing Lieutenant Kim coming into his own. And I really kind of like the fact that the last book in this Star Trek Voyager line is a Lieutenant Kim novel. It kind of like, oh, he gets to have the, the last say in this story. And I, I kind of appreciated that heavily for this. Um, the other part of this story that I really found interesting was the Edramaya, the, the aliens that I talked about. With the Edramaya, we kind of get this interesting sort of eldritch horror element. And what I mean by that is that eldritch horror usually revolves around alien beings that are so far beyond us, so big, so inscrutable that we cannot understand them. And... I think Kirsten Beyer takes that sort of eldritch horror idea of something so inscrutable that we can't understand it and puts an interesting Star Trek twist upon it. Because in horror, the, the horror part of that comes from the fact that we cannot understand them. But for Star Trek, when that comes up, the characters actually take moments to think like, oh, how sad it is that we are unable to understand these people, that they're so far beyond us that we're actually kind of sad. So it kind of takes this horror element, and there is some interesting horror stuff with the Edromaya, how creepy and, and kind of scary they are. There's a wonderful scene with them uh, encountering, uh, I don't want to spoil a little bit, but there's a really creepy scene encountering a famous alien race that we see with the Edromaya that I found fascinating, and also some of the stuff they can do, like blowing up stars, which we saw in the last book. So they can they can do some pretty powerful stuff. But instead of like taking that horror element, Kirsten Beyer basically takes it off in a tangent being like, oh, isn't it sad that we, we aren't there yet, that we can't understand these people, and we want to understand them. So I like that sort of twisting of that Eldritch Horror idea and sort of turning it into something brand new, um, which I thought was a, a really great Star Trek twist on, on the whole idea um, and, and that concept. And actually gets paid off, again, without spoiling, um, with how that relationship with the Edramaya develops, even though we can't fully understand how to communicate with them. It's, it's very, very fascinatingly done. And there are a ton of other things that this book touches upon. There's a wonderful medical ethical drama going on here with Harry Kim's aforementioned um, kind of girlfriend where she uh, is basically having a deteriorating uh, disease that basically causes her to lose um, sort of mental functions. And the doctor sort of debates putting her into a, um, a, a holographic body. And... It was just very well done. It was this wonderful discussion of how emotions can sometimes be clouded. And when we get put into a holographic body, we may have a chance to sort of like see things a little bit more clearly. Again, getting back to Kirsten Byer's really emotional understanding of her characters. And I like that there's a swerve with that character that I won't uh, spoil that you would not have expected. But you could see that Kirsten Byer arrived at that character decision very organically out of following where the character wanted to lead her rather than... Um, 
rather than sort of the plot dictating where that character is going to go, which is, again, an element that I think we see in Star Trek Discovery. I think we start seeing that these characters have a lot more internal lives that start dictating where they go within the story rather than the plot sort of dictating where the character's arcs go. And I, I really credit Kirsten Byers sort of uh, letting the characters have an emotional life of their own that doesn't necessarily seem to be dictated by the plot uh, of the story. So I, I greatly appreciated her writing for that. The one final note that I want to touch upon with this book that I thought was absolutely fantastic was while this book is very much a Harry Kim novel because that's kind of where the story was going to be before um, Kirsten Byer got hired on Discovery and before she knew that she was this was going to be her last book but because this is going to be her last book she did a lot of work to do two things one the kind of uh, interesting thing that has me very intrigued is there is hints and this is a minor spoiler towards some temporal stuff going on with the Krenim which many of you know uh, are the aliens from Year of Hell they were doing uh, the Star Trek Voyager episode Year of Hell where they were doing a bunch of wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff so that's that's not a main focus of the story, but we get hints of it. And listening to interviews with Kirsten Beyer, we get sort of hints that that may be coming up in another book or uh, several books that take place after this that may be trying to tie in the post-Star Trek Nemesis literary timeline with the events of Star Trek Picard and uh, now Star Trek Discovery that don't necessarily gel with those books. So I'm assuming there's going to be a big crossover book that's going to have all this wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff happening that will eventually sort of reset the canon and say, all these books did happen, but the inconsistencies have changed because of time travel. So I'm very excited for that book, and I like that there's some subtle hints at that setup here. Um, again, we don't know for sure. There hasn't been any announcements from Simon & Schuster, at least at the time of this recording. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where that goes, but I like that hinting and that layering in for future storylines here. Um, and I, I like that sort of continuity and sort of recognition that the continuity is coming to an end. Very cool stuff here. But the more important thing for this novel that I find kind of uh, wonderful and beautiful is that Kirsten Byer sort of takes these moments to sit with our characters that we are going to be saying kind of a goodbye to, at least these versions of the Voyager characters. We'll be getting Janeway in Star Trek Prodigy in the, the animated show that's coming up, and maybe a few other Voyager characters will pop up here and there and things like Star Trek Picard. But these versions of these characters that we've been following for several books in Kirsten Byer's story so far now will be coming to an end in this book, or, you know, for most part, with maybe that little side story that I told you about um, containing some of them as well. And I think there's just some really wonderful, beautiful moments. And I think uh, this is a spoiler for the end of the book, but there is a really wonderful scene where Chakotay and Catherine Janeway finally get married. And all the characters come together, and it's, it's a really beautiful scene that isn't lingered upon too much. And Kirsten Beyer talked about this in an interview, but I think it was just, it was beautifully done in the sense that it wasn't like, let's stop at each character and, like, have a moment with them, and, and like, there's this culmination arc. It was just like, no, this is something that they do. And then they go on to their next adventure. And their next adventure is something big and wondrous that I don't want to spoil. But it is an interesting sort of set off for these Voyager crew. Taking them on a path that they have always followed. Sort of being on their own and charting their own course in uncharted territory. But takes it to the next level. And isn't just them redoing the same thing. So I like that sort of send off for these characters. is an emotional way with the wedding and all of them coming together. And also stuff with Harry Kim. Uh, Tom Paris gets some stuff. Sepna 9 gets a little bit of moments peppered through in to show her development. And then them getting getting sent off into this new adventure in a new way that I think really kind of um, just culminates their arcs in, in a really beautiful way. So credit to Kirsten Beyer for, for finding a way to wrap up these characters in, in a wonderful way. Um, so overall, I am very high on this book. I think it was one of the most emotional stories I've seen done with uh, with the Star Trek Voyager crew, one of the better written and, and understandings of these characters that I've, I've seen ever. And I also uh, think that the Eldritch Horror element was really cool, and I think it's also a good capstone for this version of the Star Trek Voyager crew, and also heading off into this the ending of this uh, literary universe that we've had for over a decade now since the end of Star Trek Nemesis that I have emotionally invested in and really came to love. So I I'm glad that there's going to be some sort of conclusion to all of these stories that I've really invested in. And it's not going to be like a Star Wars legacy situation or Legends situation, I should say, where the where Disney comes in and says, ah, all those books you cared about, they don't matter. Um, I'm liking that Simon & Schuster and the Star Trek license holders are giving uh, the Star Trek writers a chance and us fans to have a sort of conclusion with all of these characters, even though um, it's probably not even in their financial best interest to do so. They probably want to be pumping out, you know, other tie-in media stuff, which they've already started to do to a degree. But I I'm liking that they're at least giving the fans this moment, and it's something that Disney did not do. 
Um, and I, I just greatly appreciate them for that and taking that, that own course there. So that's my review of Star Trek, uh, Voyager to lose the earth by Kirsten Beyer, a wonderful book that I would highly recommend. I would highly recommend all of Kirsten Beyer's Star Trek Voyager book, especially if you're a Voyager fan, um, and want sort of more continuing stories and emotional evolutions with those characters. Um, and I think it ends in a really wonderful place. So let me know what you thought about this book. If you liked this review down in the comments below, don't forget to subscribe to this channel as well for more discussions of Star Trek books and other really, really niche nerd stuff um and also have a patreon which helps me pay the bills so don't forget uh to help me out over there if you're able and want to get yourself cool perks like uh, access to a star trek enterprise podcast that i do that only goes out to my patrons but beyond all of that stuff i hope that you as always live long and prosper thank you so much to all of my patrons especially katherine lambeth ashley allen bokikio miranda janelle eli berg moss ashlyn solstice Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Chamomile T, Philip Sorbello, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Marybeth Earl, Stephen Shuthart, Wellington Marcus, Wayne Twitchell, Buttoneer, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Nathan Olson, Amanda Ronnie Indange, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F, Miguel Posadas, Jason Knott, Maeve, Andrew Jorgenston, Sabraxis, Jasmine, Chris Brown, Bree Beecher, Nathan Steele, Chloe Dollar, Jane Packard, Dante St. James, Wendizzle Bizzle, Geek Filter, Mark the Edge, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Gretchen Badger, Sarah Bystam, Celestial Dawn, Polly Mina, Din, Jean Mithoon, Lysa, Andrew Lamoureux, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy. Thank you, all of you, especially this month.